Hi everybody, I'm Michen. If you are looking at this, it means I have succumbed to uh, pressure and uh, I volunteer to do this video. <laughs> okay. Christian will be watching this also. Oh, uh, you can cut that, right? <laughs> uh, maybe? I don't uh, know. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you just cut that. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, 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 so now you're inside the, uh, the uh, yeah. NUS Intel Cybersecurity Lab. Mm -hmm. And this particular lab is uh, providing cybersecurity on a particular physical platform. And this technology is commonly known as the quantum key distribution. So what we are doing is we are generating pairs of entangled photons and send to two places, Alice and Bob. And by measuring the polarization states of these entangled photons, we are actually able to create two exactly same encryption, encryption key without ever need to exchange any correlated information between the two parties. So this key can actually provide the so-called unconditionally safe communication. So you can use this to guarantee that your communication between two places will get, never get eavesdropped. So the physical setup we have here is a correlated photon source that are generating entangled photon pairs. So what you can see, the, the, the red light here is our pump, which is at 650 nanometers. And this uh, red light gets downconverted into infrared photons at about 13, 10 uh, nanometers. And these photons go through a series of fiber connectors and enters two deployed fiber. So these are the same fibers you use for your home uh, broadband for you know, internet surfing and YouTube watching. So the fiber enters here, it goes up and travels through the entire building and then enters uh, your telecom fiber network, which goes to uh, Buena Vista, Dover, and then circle back to the US, and back to the port right next to it. Wow, so, so how, 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 like, what's the distance this whole, like, like uh, so, so between this port 3 and port 4, we have a 10 kilometer fiber. Between okay. 5 and 6, we have yet another 10 kilometer fiber. Thank you. So okay. in total, we have about 20 kilometers of distance connecting uh, our receiver A and receiver B. But, but if, if, if like, light travels across such a long length of fiber, what, what, would it like have loss of signal or whatsoever? So, so, so the rule of thumb at 1310 is uh, about every 10 kilometers, you lose half of the photons. Okay. And that is if you have an ideal fiber. If you have joints in between, you lose even more. So, so for us, um, I think we have in total of about 15 dB of, uh, of loss across these fibers. So that translates to about uh, I think seven or eight percent of the total photons that get through survive this process and eventually reach the detectors. Okay. What's the point of traveling so long? Uh, let's say you want secure communication between you know City Hall and Changi Airport. You do need this much distance oh. of fiber to connect the two places. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I mean, one key point of the QKD technology is people try to establish QKD links over longer and longer distances. So for Singapore, it's a small city, so we can still do it with fibers, like within a few tens of kilometers. You can also go to larger kilometers, but you will need to send the photons via free space rather than fibers. Now, people also do that. They do this by putting the entangled photon source onto a satellite, and the satellite will shoot the photons down to ground stations. That, they can actually do it over like a, a few thousand of kilometers. So, so like, do you know roughly like what's the uh, longest length that they've been doing this on? Uh, on fiber, mm -hmm. uh, there are different protocols. Uh, so, so one particular protocol is called the prepare and measure protocol. So, in which they don't really use entanglement at all. They just send laser pulses and then they modulate the laser pulses to different states and measure on the other side. So, this type of protocol you can actually go uh, quite large distances even with fiber. So I think the I think they can do about one hundred something kilometers. Now this distance is much more limited if you are using fiber and entangled photon pairs together. So our uh, our successful record currently in our setup is about 10 kilometers. We have some colleagues who can also do 20 kilometers in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And there's also another group in in, in I think in, in Austria they managed to do it over about 90 kilometers submarine fiber, but they have like much better detectors than ours, and they, um, yeah, they managed to actually generate a little bit amount of key over 90 kilometers of fiber. Actually, uh, just a side question is like, who are your like the primary in, uh, interested parties in this kind of technology? So I think there's a there's a, a pattern of how this type of research is going is. 
these research projects are usually funded by, by, by giant telco companies okay. because they are the ones who are interested in providing uh, secured communication services. And uh, these are usually backed by government agencies mm -hmm. and also military sectors because um, these are also quite crucial for uh, the stability of your government operation and military operation. Okay. Okay. Uh, a lot of the items here seems to be uh, homemade. Do you all like usually like are these like can be this bought or or like what what are these these kind of uh, things? So, so the the rule of thumb here is if something's black, it's most likely bought from a commercial company. Uh, but all these aluminum blocks, we mm -hmm. actually machined it ourselves, and a uh, big because we we really made an effort to try to make source as compact as possible, so okay. that uh, one can actually integrate it in a relatively small platform and uh, you know commercialize this. So so like there's some design consideration like like when you can't really get it off the shelf, then you have to you have to design it. Or like uh, if you want you want a, a tighter space for form factor, then you have to. Uh, customize it yourself? Uh, yeah, I'll exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. Is this just limited to um, the like the optical stuff that you all use or like do you all actually like, design other, other things? Mm, I mean, electronics-wise, we I think most of the electronics are actually designed by our own people. Okay. Uh, actually, actually designed and also assembled, soldered by our own people. So, so would it be like an example would be like this kind of device? Yeah, I mean, all, all yeah. these have the security label on this. This, these you can't really buy it from anywhere. We actually, okay. our group designed it ourselves. Okay. But it's a spin-off company, right? So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Okay, now. Uh, okay, here we have uh, one of the receivers. Usually, in this kind of QVD setup, we have. Uh, we have two receivers mm -hmm. for one link, so we usually call them Alice and Bob, just to you know, word game here. So let's call this uh, Alice setup. So, so the photon will enter from this uh, fiber here. Mm -hmm. It shoots to a beam splitter, which just means the photons will have a 50-50% chance of either going up or going to the left. So if the photon is going up, they'll be measured in the horizontal and vertical polarization basis. Mm -hmm. If it goes to the left, it gets measured at, uh, I think, plus 45 and minus 45 polarization basis. Okay. And this same setup is actually duplicated exactly over there. Um, and uh, although it seems that the, the two receivers are located in the same lab with the source, they are optically 10 kilometer each away from the source. So uh, I, I do realize that um, you have many components that like, like I believe this is uh, this is this uh, collection where you collect the light from, right? Yeah, but I do do see that you have another optical component here. So like, why do you need like so much so many different optical components for? Uh, I mean, it's it's actually uh, relatively difficult to try to send in light mm -hmm. from here and then make sure that it gets refocused and coupled into this fiber at mm -hmm. about thirty cm away. Okay. So we do need a lot of degree of freedom to to fine tune the the pointing of your beam to make sure that most of the photon that comes in mm -hmm. leaves and gets detected by your single photon detectors. Okay. So so that so this additional uh, mirror here is to just to help to increase the yeah, increase degree, the of, degree freedom, of freedom uh, freedom to, to yeah. okay cool. okay I'm just curious what what are these things so these are the detectors that are so sensitive that are able to detect single photons so so the normal detectors you have uh, for example in your home uh, network terminal mm -hmm. inside there's usually a photodiode. Basically, that kind of detector receives a certain amount of light and converts the light to a electrical current. And okay. the, the current uh, is, of course, proportional to the intensity of the light. Now, these kind of detectors are different. They, uh, even if a single photon comes into this detector, mm -hmm. although a single photon doesn't contain a lot of energy, but this is already enough to trigger a po electrical pulse generated from this detector. So to, it's, it's not really easy to do this. Uh, uh, in order to be so sensitive to detect single photons, you, you need a special uh, material called uh, indium gallium arsenide, and you need to make it in a special way such that a photon comes in, it triggers a photoelectron, and this photoelectron keys gets accelerated and triggers yet another two uh, photoelectrons, and the two becomes four, four becomes eight, and they cause a so-called avalanche effect inside. So one photon gets converted to 
like a lot of electrons and they form an electrical pulse that okay. represents the arrival of a single photon. And also, in order for this to be sensitive, you also need to keep it at very low temperatures. Ah, yeah. So these, so, so although each module looks gigantic, but if you look at the top part, this is really just a heat sink not unlike the ones you use for your gaming computers, mm -hmm. uh, for the cooling system of your computers. The only detector part is actually uh, this very thin layer on the bottom. So, so the reason why we have this uh, heat sink is because we need to cool the detectors down to minus 50 degrees and keep it that way. So you need a huge heat sink and you need a fan to constantly remove the heat and make sure that they work. Oh, that's nice. Just now you mentioned you got a few here, what do you mean? Uh, so 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 let's say you are you have your incoming photon coming this way and you don't put this mirror here you just put your coupler directly here. Now what if your coupler is like off to the left by a, like one millimeter or something? Then then you will have to physically like unmount your coupler and then move it until you find the optimal spot. But if you put a mirror here, you can actually just tune the tilting angle of the mirror so that the beam will get scanned left or right or up or down and then find the center of your coupler. So you, you can keep all your components fixed and you don't really need to... Uh, you only need to tune these two little knobs to, to, to couple all your lighting to the fiber. I do realize that like um, there are things that look quite similar here in the lab, like this uh, white color thing here, mm -hmm. this yellow thing here. Like what? What? Uh, what, what, okay. what these so are? these are these are actually uh, optical fibers. So uh, I guess I I have a few interesting to show you. Okay, so this is what I dug out from the lab just now. So these these are actually the, the okay. telecom fibers that will carry your internet data here. So if you zoom in closely. This one cable contains about 12, 12 strands of fiber. Okay, maybe you show a photo here, because can't really see it. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this one cable contains 12 strands of fibers, mm -hmm. and uh, each fiber can carry, can, can say connect to a different household in your home. And all these fibers are protected by this very rigid layer of coating mm -hmm. so that it doesn't get bent easily, because fiber are actually quite fragile, and if you, if you bend them too much, they, they will break because in, inside the fiber it's actually just a few silica so they are like not that much different from your normal Shoot. glass, oh, glass. They're very fragile and okay. they can they can just crack easily if you bend them too much okay. so these are the uh, telecom cables that you used for your internet traffic we have one exactly here and that goes up and then you know connects to the to, to the outside world now if you're at your home uh, you can also find some fiber at your home. Um, if you are, if you have signed up for this uh, fiber home broadband, you know from local telcos, the M1 or Singtel, then usually they have a fiber that's connecting the outside to your optical network terminal ONT. This is usually located somewhere at the entrance of your home. Uh, there's usually a cabinet that holds these things. So the fiber at your home is usually looks like this. It's usually yellow with a green end. And this is the tip of the fiber. Uh, you probably can't see it very clearly in the video. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so you have the coating of your fiber and at the very center you have your cladding mm -hmm. and the core. So how a fiber works is that the core at the very center has a different refract refractive index from your cladding. And light gets um, you know, total internal reflection. So they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are bounded to this particular type of waveguide and then they can never leave the fiber until they reach the other end. So this is why you can use optical fiber to send light over long distances without causing too much loss. During so is it quite similar to like the cables that we use for our computers and like uh, maybe the internet cables or something? Your, your internet cables carry electrical signals inside mm -hmm. and this actually carries uh, light signals. Okay, but how, how do we know actually light is going through them? Can we, can we actually see the light coming out? Uh, I guess so. Okay, so, so this, is a, this is a normal laser pen and uh, this is actually something the, the fiber engineers from the telcos will do when they try to detect the fiber fault or something. Okay. So that, that's a laser? That's a, that's a laser oh. pen, it's a, you know, it's true laser. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, now you just plug this into one end of the fiber and 
before that, I need to tell you a safety information that's very important. When your fiber one end has something plugged in it, never, never, never look it directly into the eye. This is a very important safety message. Never look into the eye when your fiber is plugged in <laughs> something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, otherwise, I'll be in trouble. Okay, so, so if, I, if I switch on the fiber pen here, wow. and I have light coming out from the other end. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I suppose it's a bit too much to tell them of the difference between single mode and multi mode. Okay. But do all fibers like uh, come in this kind of packaging? Uh, no, actually they have several different packagings. So, so you notice this particular fiber, the two ends look very different. This one is a circular and metallic material shape. Mm -hmm. This one is plastic and green. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call a FC connector, which mm -hmm. is typically used for, for lab environment. Uh, you don't really see this very often in, in industry. Now this green one is called SC connector. It's a square connector type, which is very commonly used in telecom industry. So the reason why is because this is very easily uh, pluggable. So for example, I have a... So this is one of the, the port to connecting to the telecom network. I just put it in. Oh. And here click, then it's connected. Okay. If I want to remove it, out. So so this makes life much easier for the fiber engineers when it comes to uh, diagnosing network issues because what they are facing is usually like hundreds of thousands of connectors and they need to quickly like detect which one is a faulty one, which one is not. So, so I mean, just uh, another question is like, so wh why do they still have this kind of connectors instead? Uh, this one, I, I, I don't know the exact reason, but the reason why I like this is, uh, uh, so, so for example, the connector for this type of uh, fiber end is usually this. So you have the ta uh, the tap threads. So you need to insert the fiber tip, and then screw it tightly. So it's uh, the reason why I like this is this is mechanically very stable. It doesn't it doesn't really wobble around and the fiber core doesn't get bent inside. Mm -hmm. So if you have two fibers with FCN connected to each other, they are very stable. They don't get extra losses. So unlike the SC type because you know, this is plastic, this is also plastic and the plastic and so things get very wobbly inside and if you if you keep touching it or moving it around it the, the connection actually gets a bit lower over time. Yeah. So I guess this is the reason why in experimental part it's more preferred to use this FD type. Yeah. But then this is a bit annoying because every time you need to unscrew it and take it out. So, you know, add one extra second to your operation. I see. So, um, yeah, so you said these are detectors. Are these the only kind of detectors that you use in your lab? Uh, so these are the quite common types we have for single photon detectors. There is indeed another type of detector that's uh, a bit more fancy than this. So uh, if you come, uh, as you can probably notice, we have one fiber that stretch here all the way to the next one. Sorry. You're filming for outreach, sorry. Yeah. And eventually we reach this cute little piece of devices. And you can hear the, 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 the very noisy sound. So this is what we call a superconducting nanowire detector. So Okay. So, yeah. So, so how this works? Uh, so how this works is that you have a piece of silver conducting material placed inside a cryostat. This so what's cryostat a cryostat? Is, yeah. A cryostat is just a chamber that allows you to have very low temperature inside. So uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the Kelvin scale. So uh, there's an absolute zero degree, and then you have one K and two K and three K. So 1K is a roughly 1 degree Celsius in our normal daily scale. So this chamber can keep the temperature at about 3K or 4K. So our room daily temperature is about 273K. So this is about 
uh, minus 270 degrees Celsius if it converts to the Celsius scale. I think it's 290. 273 will be 0 degrees. Right? Uh, no, minus 273 is 0. Yeah, you say normally our temperature is oh, okay. 0. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay, small, small, small. So, 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 small so, so, the pilot study is about 3K or 4K. Okay, okay. So, this piece of superconducting material is placed in the cryostat and because of the low temperature it goes superconducting and now a single photon actually hits this particular piece of material and this photon's energy itself is actually enough to kick its hot spot on this material so this hot spot when the photon kicks it it goes from superconducting to non-superconducting and therefore uh, along this uh, this superconducting wire you will suddenly detect a short segment during which the resistance is actually pretty large compared to the rest of the wire. So, yeah, so this device actually has very high efficiency or can have very high efficiency. It means they can detect almost every single photon that comes without actually missing one. And another advantage is that they do have very low noise. It means uh, if you don't send any photon, it doesn't really give you any clicks. It doesn't really tell you any false count. So it has a very high efficiency of protection and a very low, what we call a dark count. Now, of course, the downside is uh, a cryostat that's able to cool things down to minus 170 degrees is really expensive. And this, yeah, just costs a lot. And it's very noisy and it's a bit annoying to have one in the lab.